He's coming. I know he is. Hey. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Sitting outside there, huh? We're in our sunroom, yeah. Or as my oh, friend okay. likes to call it, the Daily Dose set. <laughs> How are like you? It. I'm good. 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 It's nice to see you. It's been a Me while. Too. Yeah. How are you guys? Good, good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I kind of can't believe that we're a little bit in the same COVID boat we were in when we met with you last summer, and we should be in a much different boat, but I guess that's a topic for a different day. Yeah, the boat isn't chosen by us. No, that's very true. That's a that's a kind way to say it. It's a loser. Yeah. Hi, can you hear us now? Yes. Sorry, we came downstairs. We're going to try try something else here. I'm very sorry about this. It's all right. Okay. Good morning, Mike Mattis. Thanks so much for joining us on Daily Toast. Uh, You're welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, yes, yes I, I think take two might be the uh, might be the answer. You are incredibly kind to stay Thank patient with much. us. Um, so, Mike, I, I was saying that we had posted the video yesterday where you were featured your childhood and your very young adulthood self and sort of this, you know, very, very typical path if we decide that boys of single moms are only going to have one trajectory. And I'm the mom of a uh, single mom of a boy who's also gone on to be successful. So I would like us to help reshift that trajectory and that stereotypical conversation. You certainly, uh, I think, have played your part in helping to do that. But give us a little bit of sense of your there to here, because your story is remarkable in so, so many ways. And what you've overcome is incredible. So start where you want to start, Mike, and we'll just be along for the journey. All right. Well, so you know, it all starts with being born, of course. And, uh, you know, my mother was an immigrant from Norway and came over with her grandmother, Peggy, or her mother, Peggy, my grandmother. And Peggy was an archetypal, you know, Norwegian stoic, rarely talked, only if necessary to communicate some information about something that needed to be done. And uh, I don't know anything about my mother's story, really, except one thing. And she was married uh, earlier uh, to a guy named Mattis, which is where I got my last name. I was not born from him, but she was subsequently divorced and kept the last name. And they had a child uh, and he was severely mentally handicapped and had to be institutionalized. And uh, she worked as a waitress, a uh, couple of jobs, uh, full time, daytime and night and weekends. And and uh, at one of her jobs, she met and had an affair with the married owner of the restaurant who also had three children and I was born. And so I, I have the last name Mattis from her original marriage. And uh, and then, you know, there I was in 1954, you have to picture the time, you know, this is well before the more accepting attitudes we have about a lot of things. And so there's my mother working uh, single uh, with, uh, you know, a child out of wedlock, an illegitimate child, as they used to call it. And, uh, and, and then I was fatherless. So but that was fine because as you know you, as a kid you tend to live in a bubble mm -hmm. and if everything is stable and generally safe you know that bubble is okay and things were stable and safe because peggy uh, my grandmother lived with us for uh the first 10 years of my life and then she died of cervical cancer um mm -hmm. and as is typical of uh uh there's just a lot of noise in the background. I don't, I don't understand what it is, but just as long as you're not hearing it. Well, it we don't hear it. I'm very it's, sorry. It's kind of music too, even. Oh, it was uh, our clock is probably what you heard. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, she had cervical cancer and never told me about, about the bleeding. And then she had brain metastases and became uh, weird and, and then died rapidly. And so it was at that point where the, the wheels sort of started coming off the bus. My mother's working two full-time jobs. I'm home alone in the apartment, uh, you know, now after school and cooking my own TV swans and dinners and, and the like and watching Bewitched and Leave it to Beaver. And, you know, it was kind of fun. Uh, but, but then, uh, you know, my longing for a father was pretty deep. Uh, 
Uh, I lived uh, on what I call the other side of Hennepin Avenue, which is a main thoroughfare through uh, Minneapolis. And on the other side of Hennepin Avenue is what is the neighborhood called Kenwood. And that was a very well-to-do area. And I went to school in, a, in, a, in, a, in an elementary school in Kenwood. So I was surrounded by kids who uh, were from well-to-do families and two parents and everything was, quote, perfect. And so it created a deep longing for a father on my part. And one day, uh, you know, mom showed up with a new boyfriend, Ralph. Uh, he had just gotten out of the Navy after a 20 year career as a cook. And uh, he still had his uniform on. He just gotten out, bought a car and, and was moving to Minneapolis. Uh, and so this was great. I mean, I thought, okay, now I, I might have a father that I've always wanted here. And it was great in the beginning, uh, and mom quit working then because he worked full time as a guard at a, at a factory plant. And, uh, you know, it was it was really nice because he was around. And of course, the honeymoon period of his relationship with me was in full force. And, uh, you know, mom's cooking dinners and suddenly, uh, you know, we're a family uh, and it was it was really great until uh, mom started her drinking, which I'm, I'm quite sure was present prior to this, but just not uh, visible to me. And uh, I really didn't know about the drinking until one Sunday morning uh, when they were in the kitchen and Ralph and she were in there and I didn't know what they were doing. It was about 11 in the morning and I'm in the other room sitting at a cardboard table, card table, I think they're called, um, yeah, card table. Uh, building my models. I used to love to build, you know, monster models, Frankenstein, Godzilla, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting in there in my little childhood bubble and the bubble is burst pretty, pretty severely uh, when my mom walks in in her terry cloth robe, walks over to the phonograph in the corner of the room, puts on a record with Marty Robbins, the West Texas town of El Paso, which as you might imagine, mm -hmm. is quite deeply burned into my mind. And she comes stumbles over to me you know outstretched arms and you know drunk and and her robe is open in front she's only got her panties on and asked me to dance with her now you know that was a crystallizing moment in my life uh and i actually don't remember anything after that I, I, i'm quite sure i did not dance with her uh but you know those kinds of deep emotional i guess scars you know they just stay with you forever and so uh, that was the beginning of, you know, a long pattern of uh, drinking uh, and becoming bedridden ultimately uh, because she wouldn't eat and then she had dentures. Uh, and so she would lose weight and the dentures didn't fit. And it was just this vicious, slow, sort of actually more rapid downward spiral, ending up bedridden, bedridden you know, shitting in the bed uh, and, you know, calling out to me to, you know, to do things from the bedroom. And then Ralph was just an angry alcoholic who was still working, you know. So it was a it was a very trying environment for a, a young twelve year old. And that that cycle repeated itself. I don't know how many times over the ensuing, you know, let's see, uh, thirteen years until she died when I was twenty five years old. And it just happened again and again. And you know, she'd go to the hospital, dry out, come home, mom is back, cooking meals, everything's great. Uh, and then it got to the point where, you know, I could walk up to the door of the apartment and the vibrations in the air told me that she had started drinking again. I, I don't know how that could be, but sure as shit, you know, the anxiety level in me was very clear and it was just palpable. And, and then the whole thing would start over again. So obviously I didn't like to be home. <laughs> it makes sense. And so I, I, my, I found my friends at, at, uh, at junior high school. And they were kids who had also troubled families, nothing at the level that I did, uh, but they were my new family. And so, you know, and I became kind of the, the ultimate, you know, risk-taking juvenile delinquent of the group uh, and, you know, ended up arrested 24 times in and out of reform school, five times and stealing cars, burglarizing joints and, you know, um, you know an, an endless number of misdemeanors. And to avoid prison, I dropped out of high school and, and joined the Navy. And of course, the Navy idea is wonderful because Ralph from the Navy and everything else. And so they're all very supportive of this thing. 
I tried to go in the Marines with a friend, but uh, he was hypertensive. And so I said, screw that. I'm just going to go in the Navy. And the Navy was, you know, more of the same, really, because I was in, this is during the Vietnam War, and people weren't too fond of the military during that time. And, you know, I was in San Francisco, uh, and, you know, it was, it was hey, Ashbury, LSB, all that stuff. You know, people won't even, a lot of people listening to this probably won't even understand the, the you know, the cultural wave and changes and the unrest that was going on at that time. Uh, but, you know, I was an attractive young man and, and it was the first time that I'd been exposed to gay men, like trying to pick me up all the time mm -hmm. out there. Uh, and, and so, but then on the ship, I was also in a box on an aircraft carrier with 50 other guys with many stories just like mine or similar. And so I was in with the same crowd and, um, and, you know, got into trouble in a variety of ways, my Navy, you know, the same stuff, but I managed to get through it and get out with the honorable discharge. And, um, but I was on the back of the carrier one night and I was smoking a joint out at sea. And, and I, what my job was in the Navy was chipping paint and, and that kind of stuff. And I hated it. And so I, I was in the middle of my smoking the joint and the, the awe of the great, blue sea and the dark night above me, I realized that, you know, either I'm going to go to prison if I keep this up, or I'm going to end up like Ralph, you know, and, you know, doing a job I hated, uh, or I'm going to go to school. It, it, those were just sort of the three options that I saw in front of me. So I decided to go to school. Uh, and then I got out of the Navy, I got my GED, and I rolled in junior college and uh, worked uh, full time uh, at night from 530 to 130 vacuuming carpets at the IDS center. And, you know, I think one of the things that sets me apart from some other people is, that, you know, a very energetic individual. Um, and, you know, that was true in terms of my arrests. I mean, I just was always, you know, out there, you know, pounding something. And so at the janitor thing, I mean, I, I could do my job in three and a half hours and I mastered it, mastered it beautifully. The rest of the people were union workers and they were very resentful of the fact that I could hammer that out in three and a half hours. So there are telltale signs of what was to come in my life in terms of energetic application, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I'm taking the bus, I'm riding downtown. Then I, you know, I get up in the morning, go to school, take the bus to work, take the bus home in the middle of the night, get up, recycle, do it all again. And I saved money through that year to buy a car because I did not like taking the bus and I bought a car. And on a Saturday, I went downtown to celebrate at Moby Dick's. I was still smoking dope and uh, drinking a reasonable amount, but not because I mean, when I was a teenager, I was taking anything I get my hands on. Uh, and so I uh, went downtown to celebrate and ended up in a high speed 60 mile an hour chase down Hennepin Avenue with the cops in full pursuit and ran into a cement pole underneath the, uh, a bridge and nearly killed myself, ended up in the hospital, liver trauma operation. And I walk out 10 days later, that's the end of all the bullshit. And so uh, I joined the YMCA downtown, started working out, moved out of my old buddies. I was living with an old buddy from my past, moved out on my own and that, I just never looked back after that. And, uh, and then I got a part-time job at a furniture store delivering furniture and it was a very high-end uh, contemporary furniture store. And it exposed me to a, a life and, a, and things that I had never seen before, personally. And I was delivering furniture to uh, this surgeon, but it wasn't just delivering stuff. He, he had custom-made things. We had to install it. It was a beautiful house that they had built. Uh, Stacy Roback, and he was a pediatric surgeon. And he sort of took me under his wing, he and his wife, Donna. And uh, I would just go out there on Sundays and hang out. He had three kids and, you know, they trusted me. And, and so one day, you know, I'm trying to tell him, what, you know, I'm now at the university struggling along. Uh, and he's, you know, I didn't know what to do. You know, what kind of career or major am I going to have? And he suggested I take a vocational interest test. And so I did. And it said, be a doctor. I mean, it was just like the dot was up here. Next dot was a physical therapist, and then the rest of it was all on the bottom. And I, of course, you know, doctor was inconceivable. I didn't think I had the, the mental horsepower for such uh, such a thing. 
but the physical therapist, I was like, oh, I don't know, that's interesting. I, I don't know what it is, but we'll take a look. And I think another thing about me, uh, and this isn't tooting my horn, it's just a fact that I've always been willing to try stuff. You know, <laughs> you, you, could, you could argue that it's, you, you know, I was willing to try all sorts of crimes too, you know, and I'm willing to try all sorts of drugs. But now I was willing to try, uh, he suggested that I did it. Okay. And then I, I'll, I'll try it. And I met with a college counselor and, and they suggested I volunteer in a re, children's rehab center to see what I thought of it. And I started taking the little science classes that were prerequisites to become a physical therapy major. And so I'm over there volunteering at the children's rehab center with kids that are uh, uh, very severe cerebral palsy, you know, and stuff. And uh, this was something I had never been exposed to either. And so I found myself feeding, uh, you know, this one kid in particular, uh, you know, you, you put the mush in his mouth and it squirts out. You got to use a spoon to scrape it up and stuff it back in again. And, you know, of course, at the beginning, I was like, this is a nightmare. I can't stand this. But then over time, I ended up becoming very attached to him, you know, and I'd go over there on my own, take him out for walks so in his wheelchair and stuff. And in the beginning, I hoped nobody would see me, you know, and that stuff. But, you know, I, that all dissipated. Uh, and and so that that um, uncovered a quality of, you know, humanness that uh, had been covered up until that time. And then one day I'm at the bus stop because I didn't have a car anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting at the bus stop and I'm thinking about things and I, and I just said, you know, fuck it. I'm going to go to medical school. And it was that, that's where the decision came from. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's when I really put the pedal to the metal. So I just, basically my life became studying and I would allow myself to go out for a hamburger on Friday night. There's a place called the Haberdashery over on the, on the uh, West Bank. And I'd go over there and have a hamburger. Uh, and then I, I just worked all the time to study. And I did very well, ultimately. I had to hire private tutors, but ultimately I didn't need them. And I just was, I became very good at all the, diff, you know, calculus-based physics and all, all that stuff. And I, I loved it. And I got into medical school. And, you know, uh, and I loved the clinical work in medical school. And, you know, I decided based on entering the surgical rotation while I was a medical student, uh, that this was my tribe. You know, the, the thrill and excitement of being on a surgical service and the intensity of it was right up my alley. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, all the other rotations were like, I don't know what to do. I mean, it was just so boring. Uh, <laughs> but surgery was, was my baby. And you know, the, I think a lot of physicians, they choose careers appropriately so based on the tribe and the nature of the people that are in it mm -hmm. i mean for instance and this is not being disparaging about neurologists or radiologists but you know they're just very their personalities are very different and i couldn't be around that continuously so i had to be with people like myself and naturally gravitated to that so i went to the university of minnesota surgical training program it was brutal uh, the amount of work and sort of subjugation that you experienced there was incredible, but it taught me a, a lot about what I was capable of and I, that I had no idea of in terms of, you know, being able to endure and tolerate and keep going no matter what. And I like to say, you know, I learned uh, five critical habits or they were beaten into me uh, during the surgical residency, you know, the say yes to everything habit, because basically you're, you know, a modern slave. Uh, the second is, you know, discipline habit, uh, you know, and I was very good at that. Um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of residents would, after they've been up, so you, you had to work 36 hours straight and yet, you know, after 24 hours, you know, you got to work the full day next day. And so a lot of residents were up there shoveling food in, cause you know, when you get tired, you get hungry, right? It's common. And. I didn't like that because it didn't make me feel good for the day. You know, I'd you know, be up there eating eggs and all this other crap. And so I trained myself to just bring in a Yoplait yogurt and eat that. And I made sure I went down, showered, shaved, and I'd walk outside and then come in pretending I was starting a new day. And goddamn, if I, that kind of mental trickery really didn't work. And so I developed that pattern. I never gained any weight where <laughs> most of the other residents gained weight. and. And that, you know, they'd be kind of 
uh, flopping around that 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 next day, unshaven in their scrubs, you know, just looking and kind of almost feeding into the I'm miserable, you know, mm -hmm. sort of mindset. And and I didn't do that, and uh, it worked for me. So that's a discipline one. Say yes, discipline, and then of course you know be strong, uh, no matter what. And you know of course when I, I got divorced, I was married, I had kids, and uh, you know it was really awful. I was deeply depressed, and you know it was just a horrible experience for me. And you know, but I had to pretend I was okay all the time. And you didn't admit, you know, it was shameful to admit, you know, that if you were struggling or not. And then uh, the. Uh, um, the self-sufficiency habit, which mm -hmm. is bred from, you know, that be strong habit. And, you know, I can manage my stuff on my own. I don't need help. And then, you know, the final one is fix everything. You know, it's a surgical mindset. You know, there's a solution to everything. Uh, and that includes emotions, you know, all, any, anything you can think of, there's a, there's a fix for it. And all that stuff was great. I mean, those are really great skills to have. <laughs> Uh, until they're not, uh, you know, they work in, in, in a way, in a variety of things, but wisdom is really about knowing when that shit doesn't work, you know, mm -hmm. and when, it, when it's time to pivot on that stuff in the moment or in the circumstance. And so, but I didn't understand that at the time. Uh, and so it, it, but those things served me well because I joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota after doing a two-year fellowship in, in Toronto in thoracic surgery. And, you know, next 20 years, very, very successful career, became a full professor and endowed chair. I became the program director of general surgery, you know, making good money, vice chair of the department and so on. Uh, and, you know, the say yes to everything habit had me very busy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, doing a lot of stuff, a lot of which I ultimately ended up not liking. And, uh, but so I find myself at 20 years running madly, uh, doing a lot of crap I didn't like. And, there's this kind of deep malaise that just sort of started to grow in me. And my wife is a high, my wife now, Leanne, is a high risk obstetrician. We had three kids, so we had a total of six kids. And, you know, she was of the same ilk. Uh, you know, she was trained during my era. And, uh, and, and so, you know, our lives are, they're nuts. I mean, she's in house call, you know, working like crazy. I'm doing all this, you know, and the one thing we managed to do as a family is eat dinner together. I mean, that was a big deal. And that was a, a saving grace for all of us. But, you know, it just, it was not good over time. It's very thrilling in the beginning, but it's over time, it's just not a good way to live. And so my one solution to all of my troubles was exercise. You know? And that started after the car accident. And, um, I, I joined the YMCA downtown after the accident, and now I'm taking the bus again, of course. Uh, but I gravitated to the weight room. I love that because there were characters there, you know, characters that I understood, <laughs> uh, and and never quit. And, you know, started running and and that, and that. And so, I mean, I was fanatic about it. I mean, I no matter what, I don't care if I was up 36 hours. I always went to the gym. I'd have my running stuff in the car. Winter, I'd get the stuff on in the car, run then go home. Uh, Cause I knew if I didn't do that, I would be even, you know, just, it didn't work for me. And so that's the state of affairs. And suddenly I had, I mean, I started having bad back pain and pain in my legs. And long story short, I had a five level lumbar fusion cause I got to fix everything, you know? And that was a medieval operation. And, but I, I got through it, went back to work and I discovered when I could hardly walk after coming out of the oar that both my hips were bone on bone that I didn't know. And so I, you know, Mr. Fix it calls a guy, a pain guy, uh, to uh, do injections. He does them; they don't work. But then he's a pain guy. He's an anesthesiologist. And he writes me a prescription for 360 uh, Norco, their narcotic pill. Wow. Yeah, 360, not 30, but 360. So it's a canister of pills, and I'm looking at him, thinking, you know, you better watch it. You can get addicted to this stuff. But I thought, you know, self sufficiency habit kicks in. Now you can handle it. Uh, but obviously I couldn't. So, you know, over 18 months without anyone's awareness, my wife and everybody included, I just slowly uh, descended into hell. And, you know, I got 
I never had to go to clinic or anything else. I, I just, he'd give me whatever I wanted, you know, canister of pills of different things. And it all came to a head and, and, you know, I ended up in Hazel and, you know, in treatment. So overnight I went from full professor and dog chair, blah, 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 to just another miserable addict in rehab, you know, and I wasn't happy <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and, you know, I, I just didn't, the whole rehab thing, you know, I, I just, but I, I, I had nowhere else to go. It was, it was a catastrophe in our family and for me personally. So I did it. I did the three months up there at Hazelin and I, I tried hard to buy into the, the AA protocol, the 12 steps. And I mean, I really, I really did. I read it. I read everything. I, I, you know, went to do my fourth step with one of the counselors and, and all that stuff. But there was an irritating side to that for me. And, you know, this constant focus on character defects, which I understand, uh, but it's, it's too much for me. I mean, my life, I felt that I had contributed quite a bit in my life. And sure, you know, the, in, in the addiction, there are people who suffer, you know, as a consequence of that. And so whether you call that character defects or just the nature of the beast, uh, you know, and I was more than willing to, you know, make amends. And I did, I really, and the way I made amends was through my actions. You know, when I got out, I mean, I made a commitment to like, I was determined to never let that happen to me again. And cause I, the impact on my family was just so significant. And I knew it was gonna take quite a while for me to regain their trust and, and confidence. Uh, but, you know, I had, I had 20 years of career where I'd done a lot of good for a lot of people. And my kids, they were, I was always kind to my kids. I was never rough with them. I was supportive, maybe demanding and very high expectations. But I never put on them any kind of crazy shit like my parents, my mom and Ralph did, except now I had pushed the addiction thing into their world, which was devastating for me. Uh, and the level of shame that I experienced around that was really profound. I mean, we're talking profound shame, you know, like I don't want to be alive kind of shame. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, with all the physical problems and then the, uh, the emotional uh, weight of everything I've been through, with my wife's support and encouragement, I retired from surgery. And the irony about that is that, you know, I really did like being a surgeon a lot. I love the patients and I was great at it, but I was afraid of myself. Uh, and I was afraid of going back to that crazy lifestyle. That was the real, for me, that was the real thing that kept me from wanting to go back. I was, I was afraid. It's kind of like, okay, well, I can take narcotics again right now. You know, I, I should be okay. But it, to me, it felt like going back there would create that crazy, overdriven, overextended uh, world that I, I just no longer wanted any part of. And so I retired. And, I mean, to say that was a difficult transition is putting it mildly. Because uh, overnight, my identity was literally gone. And... And my whole world, my whole identity was completely packaged up by that career. So, uh, you know, I read a book that was recommended by one of the counselors at Hazel and, and it was called The Way of Transition, written by a very famous uh, expert on tra human transitions. And this was a personal journey of his. And he talked about his transitions with his wife and career, and wife dying of cancer and, and that. And he said, when you, when, you, when you encounter a major change in your life, you have to go through the neutral zone, go into the neutral zone. And that's mm -hmm. a period where you wait for the emotional turmoil and the dust to settle so you can get clarity on you know, where the next steps are instead of lurching out and trying to, as is typical of so much of our lives today, fill the void and the dif mm -hmm. discomfort with something you know, mm -hmm. to alleviate the, the pain. And so I did it. I just said, okay, I'm done with work. I'm going to become a house husband and I'm just going to ride this baby out until I start getting some clarity on what I'm going to do. And I had no idea. Now, when I was in treatment, you know, my counselor, Bruce badgered me constantly, everybody actually keep a gratitude journal and write three things in it that you're grateful for every day. <clears throat> As a surgeon, I just thought this was bullshit, you know, because I'm used to strong actions, you know, that make, I need something that really does it make a difference. And I just didn't believe it would work. But then one day my daughter, Maya, sent uh, a video to me, a YouTube 
video about gratitude. And it was a little scientific study that a student did at her school. And it showed how gratitude, you know, decreased stress and increased happiness and self-compassion. And I was like, self-compassion, what the hell is that? You know, never heard of such a thing. And, and but the science that, you know, being a surgeon and an academic, you know, that was like, okay, now I'll listen, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I got the literature out and I was like, holy shit, there's a whole body of work around this stuff. And that led me to look for, I dug into the self-compassion thing and I signed up again, one of these willingness to try things. I signed mm -hmm. up for a self-compassion retreat with Kristen Neff and Chris Germer, who are the, the two gurus of this space. And there I was at a self-compassion retreat in the desert somewhere in California, I think it was. And, you know, with 60 women and three or four other guys. And you talk about a fish out of water, you know, a thoracic surgeon with tattoos, juvenile delinquent, out there with basically social workers and psychologists, you know, putting my hand on my heart, learning to meditate and, you know, talking about loving myself. <laughs> it's like, you gotta be shit me, you know? But I stuck it out for the week. And it was transformational. It was like eye opening. It opened my world. It opened my eyes to another world uh, that I was unaware of. And and so my reality started to change a bit. And that just basically opened the can of worms for me. And I went back to learn how to become a teach self compassion. Uh, did another retreat. Went on uh, meditation retreats and med you know for physicians and the like. And I had no idea where this was all leading, but I just knew that I liked it. You know, I was learning new things and meeting people that were very interesting and had a different demeanor than, than mine. And so uh, it was it was changing my life. Now, everything was good for me. I felt content, peaceful, uh, and but I couldn't parse out whether that was all just because of the fact that I'm, I'm just not working mm -hmm. or is it because of all this stuff or all the above. Fact is, I really didn't give a shit. You know, it was working, whatever it was. And so I'm plugging along, again, no real idea what I'm going to do <laughs> with my life. I'm a house husband, but my girls now are older. And I, I, wanted, I want to just segue just briefly, because uh, one of the things I did as a house was not only I run the house with surgical expertise, you know, cooking and really, I mean, suddenly my wife was like, this is great. Uh, and <laughs> uh, but one of the magical things that happened for me was uh, I would drive my daughters to school and pick them up and attend things. Uh, and time in the car with my daughters uh, was like one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because I actually got to know them. <laughs> they weren't just another project. And so that was a big deal. Uh, and boy, if my relationships with my children changed as a result of all this. So um, I, my, my son, Sam, though, that was the different story because Sam was uh, at the Naval Academy and, and then ultimately an officer in the Navy. And he went to the Naval Academy uh, just before I fell from grace. And, you know, prior to that, I got six kids and Sam was my project because he was very disciplined. He was animal weightlifter. He boxed competitively and he went to a private Episcopalian school. It's like, nobody does this kind of crap at a private school like that, but he did. And, you know, he was a competitive swimmer, went to state, all that kind of stuff. And so he was the apple of my eye in that regard around those things. And so I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, uh, applied to the Naval Academy, got in. But about a a couple of weeks after he got in, he came to my desk and now I call it version one, version one, Mike Mattis, you know, prior to the fall was sitting at his desk and he tapped me, tapped me on the shoulder and he's kind of nervous and looking down and says, can I talk to you a minute? And I turn around and look up at my project and he says, Pi, I don't think I want to go to the Naval Academy. Now, you know, from where I come from, this was unacceptable. You have the opportunity that is, is, you know, like 0.000001% of the world gets and you're going. And I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, no, you're going. And this is the first time I ever told any of my kids what they're going to do, you know? And so he went, I mean, he was miserable because he really didn't want to be there. And, 
when he got out into the real world and went on deployment, he was in San Diego, went out, deployed over the Persian Gulf for eight months, came back. When he got back, he was drinking a fair amount, like all of the Navy guys. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and we rarely talked. Uh, and he bought a Harley Davidson. And so now version two, Mike Mattis, after all the retreats and everything else, is sitting at a restaurant with his daughter, Maya, in Boston. I get the dreaded phone call. He's been in an accident. And a car had run, in, run into his leg head on and crushed his lower leg. And so, you know, version, for all Sam knew, you know, the Mike Mattis who got on that plane that night was version one because he, he's just so disconnected because of Naval Academy and deployment and everything. Uh, but it was version two that got on the plane. And so, uh, you know, for the next four weeks while he was in the hospital, while they're trying to salvage his leg with 10 operations and an episode of infection that nearly killed him, uh, you know, version two is managing all of his medical stuff, making sure the care is perfect. Uh, you know, take, you know, creating relationships with all the team members and doing all this stuff and bringing them home cooked food from my Airbnb where I was staying, never ate a single hospital meal. And they ultimately had to amputate his leg. Uh, and so they did below the knee amputation. And a couple of weeks after he was discharged, he was staying at the Airbnb with me. We decided to go out for the first night out. And we get down at the restaurant and you know, he sits down and he, he slams down three beers and and I try and make some small talk because you know it's a difficult, difficult time. And he starts screaming at me and swearing. And this is in a fairly decent restaurant, people all around us, and you know, he's yelling F you, F you. And I get him to settle down and you know, we we suffer through the already ordered meal and in a deafening silence. And, that continued as we went out to the curb. We're waiting for an Uber at the curb. And, you know, I'm on a big emotional tightrope. You know, it's one thing if, you know, somebody you don't know or care about is swearing at you. You know, you can kind of, it doesn't have the same emotional impact, but, you know, there's my boy. Uh, and, you know, the, the emotional tightrope, I realized if I fall to one side, I'd be like, no, you know, F you, Sam. I've been out here for four weeks doing all this shit, making sure your medical care is great home cooked meals. I don't need this shit. I'm out of here. Uh, if I fell the other side, it's like, you know, you're right. F me, Sam, because if I hadn't told you to go to the Naval Academy, God damn it, you'd probably still have your leg. And in that moment, I realized that uh, falling to either side would only increase the distance between us. And so I moved toward him physically, literally, and I hugged him, put my arms around him and my face against his. And I, I said, I, I can't imagine how much you're suffering. And, you know, his, the tension in his shoulders just melted and he, I stepped away and tears are streaming down his face. And he said, I don't know why I keep blaming you for everything. Mm -hmm. And the next morning we sat at a coffee shop in the sunshine in San Diego and he poured his heart out to me for two hours. And he told me literally about every nook and cranny of his life. And I didn't say anything. I just listened. I didn't try and fix any of it. Uh, and it really changed our relationship dramatically. Uh, and it was that moment and how I handled that moment that led me to realize that, you know, these softer skills or things that I've been doing, you know, gratitude, meditation, and the like, self-compassion, those were the skills that allowed me to handle that moment uh, with what I would consider to be grace, you know. And, you know, so if you parse that out, you know, the, the gratitude part gave me the right perspective, you know. Uh, I was very grateful because he had received such outstanding care at, at the center. I was really grateful for the people uh, that had given him such great care. And, and I was also grateful that he hadn't lost his life or had a serious head injury. Uh, the, the mindfulness allowed me to be present to his suffering and to mine and to not get swept up into a storm on either side of that tight, tight rope. And the self-compassion allowed me to be kind of gentle with myself in terms of blaming myself for that moment when I put my hand on his shoulder. 
And then I have created a group with surgeons in the Twin Cities uh, where, uh, you know, I, I called them a lot and got a lot of support from them. So the connection piece was important there. And so, you know, clearly these things mattered in a very critical moment uh, in my relationship with my son. And that is what convinced me to write the paper, you know, the resilience bank account, because until that I was, you know, I'm just doing my thing, you know, no big mm -hmm. deal. And, uh, and so I wrote the paper and spent, you know, seven months reviewing the literature and writing the paper uh, because I felt that surgeons, well, everybody needs to know about these things, you know? And so that's, that's the story. Well, it's quite a story, Mike Mattis. Um, <laughs> And Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, with absolutely. So, um, wow. Let's see. What What do I even think? I I I wonder. I wonder how you have managed to um, fit together all these remarkably disparate and yet common themes in your life. Because to me, listening to this, the Harley Davidson actually is sort of a good metaphor for you. So it's, you know, if you don't know anything about motorcycles, it's just a motorcycle. I, I wouldn't necessarily recognize a Harley Davidson if, if I looked at it. So it could be a piece of junk motorcycle if it runs and it's getting you from here to there. So that's sort of your early childhood, this untapped, unknown intelligence and curiosity and and potential to be so, so powerful that, that may never have been discovered had you not met the surgeon who invested in you. And then, and then the, the drug and alcohol phase, and then the screw it, I'm going to medical school phase, and the I'm going to just work 9,000 hours a week phase, and I'm going to conquer all these things. How in the world at 65-ish years old have you reconciled this long, fast journey that you have been on as, as this sort of elite thing that, that at every turn could have, could have gone a different way. How do you reconcile that? Well, I don't know that I'd use the word reconcile. Uh, what I've tried to do is sort of be a reporter on my own life and look mm. back and interrogate it. Uh, and understand to the best of my ability without making a bunch of bullshit stories up, you know, what what transpired in a given moment. And I, I could be wrong about a lot of things, but that is just my best attempt sure. to cobble things together uh, so they can be a benefit for other people. And, but I've always had a, I mean, so, you know, well, this gets at a, a separate broader issue. And, you know, um, whenever we make a judgment about someone, it's, 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 it's often, it's in a moment and it's related to a particular behavior or something they said. And we can immediately cast a spell in our heads about mm. them. And it's based on nothing but that one thing. Mm. And as, as, a, as a case in point, it's my life. Now, I used to believe prior to the narcotic stuff, I was a fervent advocate of the American dream mm -hmm. and pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Okay. Now, I, I do fervently believe that hard work pays off and introspection pays off. But if you look at how things unfolded for me, I had nothing to do with it, except the fact that I had genetic tendencies towards high energy. I was intelligent enough. Uh, and really that's about it. Mm -hmm. That's literally, I, I had a certain, you know, engine and the rest of it is, you know, the, the unfolding of the world around me that just treated me like a ping pong ball. And, you know, I've always been very curious and interested in things. Even, you know, even when I was, I mean, I was interested in learning how to steal cars, you know, or, or whatever. I mean, 
uh, and and I don't know what that's from. It's not something I conjured up, you know. Mm. Uh, and so, life is nothing, in my opinion, but a series of fortuitous concatenations. And a concatenation is a linked series of links in, in a chain. And fortuities are just things that just happen, you know. And I happen to be in these various circumstances at the right time. I mean, if I hadn't had the pain guy, that pain guy, that would never have happened, you know, uh, or maybe not have happened. So I'm bouncing along, you know, mm. responding to things that are put in front of me. And this is why judgments without the context like that are so poisonous and they so, they're so alienating. Uh, and so I actually, I used to believe big time in free will. Mm -hmm. I don't anymore. I think it's, it's an illusion. Mm -hmm. It's an illusion. Yeah, I guess I kind of do too. I mean, I, I think we've got some small choices that we do get to make, but I think those, those mile marker moments are in place and we're going to get to them one way or the other. Yeah, even the small choices though. I mean, you can only choose things that you're aware of. If you mm. don't have awareness of the choices, like some kid growing up in a ghetto, I mean, they have no idea what the possibilities are. Yeah. Uh, and then what is the basis for the decision that you've made if you got choice A and B? You could say, well, it's because blah, 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 but I, I'm not sure it's really clear why we even, how we know why we made a choice. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that's a philosophical discussion, but well, it's super interesting. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to ask before we let Mike go after this interesting and challenging I conversation? I, I nothing springs to mind because you just you just laid it all out and told us you, your story with heart and humility, and it was just wonderful to have you share it with us. Mike, no, let I'm me sorry. ask you this just for for the audience' sake, and I don't I'm not asking you to reveal anything super personal, but how is your son today? Oh, he's great. Uh, he's one of the struggles uh, for him that I didn't understand at all, of course, is that he, for him, autonomy is number one, mm -hmm. freedom to do what he wants. He loves to camp, be physical, have a certain degree of alone, uh, quite a bit of alone time. He's, he's not like me, you know, tends to be kind of more gregarious. He's very much, much more insular. And the more of that he does, the happier he is. Um, mm. And so he's, he's here right now in transition. Um, he's going to Costa Rica to live uh, coming up. And so, you know, Godspeed, you know. Absolutely. Mm. Well, uh, I think that maybe the takeaway from all of this is there's, there really is short of the thing that kills you, there's probably almost nothing you can't overcome if you put your mind to it and have the resources and the people around you who are advocating for you and providing providing opportunities for you to go forward. And you certainly are a ringing endorsement of that, of that idea. Well, I'll just leave two thoughts. Uh, one about Sam and, and that is, well, any of my kids, I, I have, I still have high expectations, all right? And what are they around? Uh, one, that you take care of yourself, mm -hmm. okay? And number two, use your talents to contribute in some way or another, whatever that is for you. So figure those two things out, stay on that path, and then I don't care what the career is and, and allow yourself the time you know, to be a human being. So those are, those are the things for my kids. Uh, and it's very clear what my expectations are around that and they feel it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, when I left Hazelin, I came home to understandably a variety of angry people. And so <clears throat> I would wake up every morning, my identity is gone. I'm anxious beyond comprehension. I don't have drugs for the solution of that. Uh, and I'm thinking every day, it was like, how am I gonna get through this day? 
how am I going to get through the next hour? Yeah. Literally, how am I going to get through the next hour? And I just learned to put one foot in front of the other and, and keep going. You know, as Winston Churchill says, when you're going through hell, keep going. Keep you know? going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we wish you continued great luck yes. with your work and your own path and your kids and everything else, Mike. And we'll hope to see you again in the cities in person where technology won't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for allowing me to share here. Today. Oh, oh thank you sharing. so, so it's much. Great. Thank you again. We'll be in touch. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Everybody else, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>